good brother here, he has asked me, you know, simply because I don't come from a church of Christ background. I come from a Pentecostal background, so he wants to know how is it that I wound up in the Church of Christ. And I'm going to talk about this, and I hope that this will actually help you, and maybe then you will also know how to bring other people that you know of that denomination to Christ, okay? So let me get everything already here. <coughs> Okay, so I call this, you know, my search to find Christ, right? In other words, my search for salvation. And it, it's sort of a, it, I guess it's sort, it's sort of a strange thing. I guess a lot of you who grew up, this doesn't make much sense to you. But anyway, my father was a Pentecostal minister. My grandfather helped to start up three Pentecostal churches. My, I had a grand uncle who was a bishop in the Pentecostal church. At five years of age, I learned to read from the Bible. That was the first book that I ever read from. It was John 3.16. Notice, five, five years, okay. I'm 76, so that means then 51 years I have been remembering, right? 76, so that means 71 years I have been remembering that. And I still remember that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Those were the first things that I learned to read. You know, so here I am again now. You know, it's all, that's all it's strange, I guess, to some people. But back in my day, you know, most people didn't have a big library. And most of the people at that time, basically, all they had was the Bible. <coughs> at the age of 10, I was the, the youth Sunday school secretary. And my, my uncle was actually the, the Sunday school secretary. And so he was the one who taught me. That's where I learned about keeping books. That's where I learned about accounting and stuff. And he taught me all of that particular thing. At the age of 12, I was baptized into the Pentecostal church. At the age of 15, I was the head of the youth choir, right? And, you know, as Ben was saying, also when I was in school, I was also, we'll say, the lead singer there. And we used to sing a lot of, we'll say, those classical music songs like Hallelujah, right? And we used to go around in my school to different other schools and contests, and we were always win, right? Because she had had, we'll say, a, a friend of hers actually was a member of the the St. Louis Metropolitan Opera, and so uh, you know, and so what would happen is he was a fifth tenor, and he would come and he would actually train us how to sing, how to you know, you know intonate our voices and also to make it sound smooth and make it sound good, right? And so I think that's probably why, you know, maybe somebody would say that we were cheating. Maybe we weren't. I don't know. But, you know, that was sort of like my background. And in fact, when I graduated from high school, I had a chance to go on, you know, to get a scholarship in music and my parents discouraged me from doing that. They didn't think that that was much of a you know, especially from a spiritual standpoint, not much of a particular type of future for that. So I also was good in science, and so I got, and also good in speaking. And I was able to get a oratorical scholarship to go on to the University of Illinois, so I took that and, and I majored in physics. Anyway, the church taught the four Gospels and the Old Testament. They didn't go much into much else, 
You know, that's all they talk about. Oh, they, oh, they knew, my father knew the, the Old Testament backwards and forwards. They used to call him Solomon. He could spout that stuff off, I mean, backwards and forwards. The church added members, and the Lord did not add members. So what that meant was that they could, they could get rid of members too as well. And so that's, that's sort of like, we'll say, uh, the, the Catholic Church as well as the Baptist churches and so forth. And in fact, of course, they were splinters. You know, all the particular denominational churches are actually splinters off of the Catholic Church, including the Pentecostal Church. And so a lot of the same idiosyncrasies that the Catholic Church has, it has. The church disfellowship members were not paying their dues. <laughs> so if you didn't pay up, not only that, you had envelopes with people's names on it. And they would keep track of who was paying and who was not paying until, you know, hey, so and so and so didn't pay, you gotta get them out of here. Unless it was some widow who couldn't pay. But if they deemed that you could pay, you didn't pay, then you were out of there. Right? And that's the way that was. The church had the, la the Lord's Supper once or twice per year, as I remember. So it wasn't like, you know, on the first day of the week. And sometimes it would be in the morning, sometimes it would be at night, depending on, I don't know who was making the decision, but that's the way it was. The church also washed feet once or twice per year, you know, and they thought that that was part of worship, but we know you know, that that's not true. That's not what Christ was trying to illustrate, just washing people's feet. It was humility that he was trying to actually illustrate. The church allowed members to shout, clap their hands, dance around during the church service, right? And you still see this in Pentecostal churches. Oh, you know, the spirit. Oh, I got the spirit. The spirit hit me. Okay, and then you just get up and people would get up and run around and if you go in there sometimes you're scared, well, this person just lost his mind. <laughs> He's just running around there, shouting and screaming and hollering, right? And so that, they, they thought that that was worshiping God, but of course, as John was talking about, when you come here, you come to worship God, right? And, and also Paul explains how to worship God properly. And it's not getting up, running around, and doing all this other thing. God is not a God of confusion. God is a God of order, okay? I guess they, they missed that. My, fa my father actually sh fought against all of that stuff, right? Clapping in hands and dancing around doing the church services and other things that they did he didn't necessarily agree with. My father had two churches. It was one in Litchfield, Illinois, and another one in Arkansas. You know, my and he didn't allow shouting, clapping hands, and dancing around during the service because he didn't think that was right in his churches. But the others, the others did. They thought that was all okay because. Let I me mean, give you a background. Probably why this is this is why I think it is, especially for the black Pentecostal churches, because of the fact during slavery. That was the only time that the slaves could get together and feel free and they could talk and so forth. So the spiritual and the social got molded together. Other times they were out in the field and <coughs> they talked to each other, they got a beat. So when they came that day, now they could talk to each other and they would sing and they would tell their stories and they would cry together and so forth. So then you still have the same type of stuff. And they would, you know, and everybody would talk about how good it was going to be to be free. And they would shout and all this other stuff because it, you know, it was real. Punishment was real. And I, that's what I believe that started a lot of that stuff. And, then, and you had then a lot of whites that came in and they actually emulated it because <laughs> they thought it was cool. <coughs> At first, the church did not allow a piano to accompany singing, and later on they did. They fought it, you know, the young guys came in and so forth, and so, you know, even, even in this church that had very little, we'll say, thing to do with God, Satan made it even worse, so he brought in the, brought in the piano. And of course, my father also 
fought against that. He kept the piano out of his church, right? My father used to say, with regard to that, you know, the Bible is right. And I, and I believe that's why he said that. Because of the fact he fought against so much. He never, he never said that the Pentecostal church was right. He always said, the Bible is right. And that was one thing that stuck in my head. So if the Bible is right, whenever I want to see what's right, and my sister used to take him up on that a lot, she is also a member of the church, and she would go to the stuff and say, Daddy, the Bible says, says this. And I, he would never say, well, they were wrong or right. He said, well, well, you know, the Bible is right. And that's it. He never told us that the Pentecostal church was right. Always that the Bible was right. So that's one thing we can actually be happy about. Because of all of this confusion and all this other stuff and watching my father and how he was fighting all this stuff, by the time I was 18, I lost all interest in the church because it did not, I did not see any difference between the church and the world. I mean, you know, you come in there, the same, almost the same type of rhythm and blues and all this other stuff going on outside. You can come into church and listen to it too. And so it's more entertainment than spiritual. So that's why I say, well, you know, who cares? <laughs> so I went on about my business, but it was not until it wasn't not until my grandfather had already died, I guess, seven years before these three died. Uh, my grandmother, my, my, both my parents died. My grandmother died in the space of seven years. Pip, 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 knocked them all out. And so for some reason, I began to say, ooh, this is serious. So what I have to do now <laughs> I have to find God. And I knew this is going back to the Pentecostals because I already knew what they were doing. So I just forgot about them. They, yeah, I had written them off already. Okay? So, so I'm in this stage, right? Where is the Lord? Because I need the Lord, right? Because I'm going to die. They died. I'm going to die. Where is God? I don't want to go to hell. Where is the Lord? I don't want to go into any of these false churches, right, who are pretending that they know God. I don't want to go to these churches where, where men are there. They haven't made heaven. I know better than that. The men never had a heaven or hell to send you to. Now, if you follow them, you'll go to hell. So, well, where is the Lord? I began to watch televangelists and read the Bible, right? They seemed to me to be satanic. All they were worried about was money. That's all they talked about all the time. You know, I got this handkerchief, you know, and, you, and if you want to be healed, you can buy this handkerchief and so forth and so on. Jesus never made anybody pay any money for any healing. They were satanic in my mind. Now, you may, you may think that they are not, but in my mind, they were satanic because they weren't doing what I had read in the Bible that Jesus did. It was not the right church. I went to the Catholic church. It was not the right church, and fundamentally because of the fact that the Pope was the head of the church and not Jesus. In the Bible, it says that Christ was the head of his church. I didn't want to be in any man's church, and especially a church that had an army that killed people because of the fact they didn't want to believe in what he told them. Jesus never killed anybody because they didn't believe. So that was not the right church. That was another man's church. And also, I saw, I went to the Methodists, the Baptists, and they were no better than the Catholic Church. And as I, and as I learned later on, they were just a splinter off of the Catholic Church. And as a side note, so are the Muslims. You have to remember that Mohammed <laughs> wife was Catholic. Mohammed 
started his own religion because of the fact that neither the Catholics nor the Jews wanted to consider him as a prophet. And you can see the, 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 the violence that he had against those people because of the fact that they didn't accept him as a prophet. And that's all it is. It's just a whining crybaby because of the fact that he was not accepted. And I said, no more, no less. No more, no less. That's all it was. And so, you know, and I, I was looking on, on the YouTube, and there was a sort of a debate between this, you know, you know, in Britain, you got, I think it's a, there's a, a park where you go in there, and then you can talk about anything. <laughs> Any old thing you want to, and they, and they were talking about, you had, you, you had a, uh, a group of so-called Christians, right, talking to, talking about the Quran, and also all of the stuff that the Quran did and how they hate everybody, and it doesn't seem, and I read some portion of the Quran, you don't see any love in it. It's all about hating people. So that's next. God, you know, so how then can that be godly? Because the Bible says that God is love. And then you open it up, and there's a hate and hate and hate and hate. So it must be satanic. So none of those actually did anything for me. You know, I used to hear the black Muslims and so forth. Waste of time. Waste of time. And they used to say, you know, well, you know, the Christian church, it's sort of funny. It's sort of funny to me why they blame the church, they blame Jesus for something that other nations have done. Catholicism is not Christianity, folks. Because, I, like I said, because of the fact the Pope has his church and Christ has his church. Jesus never killed anybody. He said, you know, even when the apostles wanted to go and say, well, you know, because they won't let us go through here, we're going to. No. He just left them alone. Put your sword down. Because he has given us free will. Those religions that take away men, men, people's free will are satanic. People should be allowed to decide whether they want to go to heaven or hell. You know, and you shouldn't be able to be, I want you to go to heaven. I'm going to beat you up if you don't go to heaven. No, that's not Christ's life. Tell them. And then if they don't want to hear it, you're going about your business. So, you know, so the, these are things that were going through, all, through my mind, how I want to. I kept asking God to lead me. God, lead me to your church. Because all these other places... You know, there are nothing. And, and of course now, in my youth, I never knew the Church of Christ. I never knew that it existed. All I knew about the Catholic Church, you know, and all of the uh, other denominational churches, right, the Pentecostal churches, I never knew that there was a Church of Christ. And that's sort of sad, right? That was sad. Never in my whole youth. I never known anybody, never heard of anybody from the Church of Christ. So I was in Canada, and of course I wound up in Canada because I came here and able to, you know, get a really good job and work for the government and also work for the Department of Defense here. And my family in the USA had not seen me for many years and wanted to, me to return to the U.S. because our parents had died. So they wanted me to come and get back to them, and so I went back. So this was part of the God's plan for me, right? So when I went back, I went to Memphis, Tennessee, where my oldest living brother lived. Right? <coughs> okay, so I'm just there, and I'm going back. I found a job teaching computer programming. Well, I have a PhD in computer science, so I was teaching computer programming at ITT Tech in Memphis, Tennessee. Guess what? I met Robert Williams, a minister of the Church of Christ. See that? You see what I'm talking about. You don't know what or when God is going to do certain things for you. You never know that, right? 
He was a minister of the Church of Christ who taught drafting at ITT Tech. We talked about the Bible and he gave me tracts to read. Now I read these tracts and I asked him questions. Robin, and I, and I, he wouldn't answer. He'd give me another track. <laughs> what? I'm saying to myself, what's wrong with this guy? <laughs> he doesn't want to talk to me, right? He keeps giving me these tracts. I keep reading, right? After a month, he invited me to his church. I accepted the invitation. After three months, I decided that God had answered my prayer and led me to finally to his church. Prayers, God still answers prayers. Notice, in my youth, I knew nothing about the church of Christ. All I knew about were the satanic churches, the so-called We'll say, synagogue of Satan. That's all I do. But I kept asking God, no, I don't want those. I know your church is there somewhere. Lead me to your church. And he did. And I was baptized and placed my membership with Robert Williams' congregation. And so about that time, notice now, at that time, at that time, I was about 50 years old, 50 or 52 years old. So all that time from 18, well, all the way up until that time, I never knew the true church. Isn't that something? I never knew, and there are a lot of people like me, but when I, it's it just like a trigger, boom, you know, my, my parents died. Then I said, you know what? You're going to die. Where are you going to go? So I'm saying, well, where's God? I got to find God. Because I do not want to die and go to hell. You know, and you go to these places and there's, you, you can see the deadness in them. You, you can just see, you know, it's just like going to Walmart. You know, or some club or something like that. So that's the way I felt. So it was over, I guess, from the time I started. It was about over... Uh, a, a two year period before I finally found the Church of Christ. And I said, wait, here it is. And I noticed something very interesting about the Church of Christ, whereas in most of those other churches, they're always talking about money. I said, okay, you know, so they ask you, well, give <coughs> whatever you can give. And the others are always talking about, you gotta give a tenth. But in the Church of Christ, they don't, they're more worried, seem to be more worried about my spiritual well-being than my wallet. I said, well, there's something wrong with these people or something right with them. They don't care about money. But what I, what, what I, I got to understand was God is going to judge you, you know. If you don't give willingly, and God knows how much you make, because he allows the people to do it. He allows you to make it. You can't fool it. He knows exactly what you're doing, and then it's all left up to God. You know, and I have a, a niece who's a member of the church, and she would say, you know, she, she lost a job, and then she wasn't making that much money, so she decided not to put a certain amount of money in church. Not put money in the church. She says that she has so many problems until she began to put money you know, give money to church again, and then a lot of stuff went away. God is your judge. Man doesn't have to judge you. God already knows. He knows everything about you. He knows your thoughts before you know your thoughts. You can't fool him. You can fool me, but you can't fool God. You cannot fool God. And so, you know, that was also something that was quite attractive. Now, people are talking about the spiritual side of man. Now people are talking about God. Now people are talking about love. Now people are talking about helping each other. So this this was totally it was totally different for me. How much time do I have? Did I use up all the time? Hmm? So that's that's basically how I I wound up in the Church of Christ, and it, it was really for me. It was really. I mean, I was just elated, you know. And I've seen churches split up, and I have given my opinion on all of that stuff. But basically what happens is that you have these people who, who again, want to be preeminent. 
They want to be able to do whatever they want to do and force God to accept whatever they do. That's not the way it is, God. God has his way. You will have to do what God wants you to do. God will not do whatever you want him to do unless you're doing what he wants you to do. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. God is the one in charge. You are not in charge, right? God, the Godhead are the ones that make the rules, right? There's an old saying, you know, he who has the goal makes the rules. That's the goal of rules. Well, who, he who is ever in charge makes the rules, and that's the way it is. We are, God has told us on many occasions we are not at his level in any way, in any way, morally, spiritually, intellectually. We are not at God's level. Forget it. Right? Just be happy that we have a loving God. Think about if Satan had all that power. Think about that. I don't think people, you know, really realize how wonderful it is to have a being so powerful that could do all kinds of bad stuff to us, but he loves us. Think about if Satan had that power of where, where we would be and what we would be like and, and, and how we'd be crawling around, and, you know, with nothing to eat and being tortured and so forth. So you can really, you should really contemplate that and and think about, you know, how wonderful it is to have a loving God. Now, I had one of my most fulfilling Christian experiences. You know, if, if, you know let me know if I, let me know if, ten minutes. Ten, ten minutes. So, yeah, and, and, you know, and I, I have been, you know, God has been so good to me. I can tell you all kinds of stuff. God has been so good to me, right? God has been really excellent to me. I got to tell you this. He's been so good to me. I got to tell you this. I remember when, when, when you know, in, in Memphis, <laughs> and I said, God, you know I need a PhD because I, I'm, you know, I don't, I'm sick and tired of teaching in these trade schools. I need a PhD to be able to teach at the university. And so I, I guess I cried and I prayed and I cried and I prayed for about, about two years. Okay. So at this place, which was actually, you know, ITT is all like a trade school, more of a trade school than it is, we'll say, a university. And I was working at another trade school at that time and so I was crying and so forth and so this lady comes in and she was supposed to be, we'll say, the librarian. Okay, so she came in and she was the sister of the of Robert Williams who brought me to Christ. And we, you know, we were talking, I found that out and so we used to talk and so she said, James, you know, <laughs> you know that the University of Mississippi, you know, they are looking for We'll say African Americans to get their PhD. They got money for that. I said, okay, well, tell me about it. Okay. And so, I, I, you know, I got all of that. I got all ready, and I was getting ready to go, you know, to University of Mississippi. And she said, you know what, James? I don't even know why I came here. They don't pay me enough money to let. God answers prayers. And through that, that's how I got my PhD, because I was there crying. <laughs> you know, we cried, I cried. I didn't cry to other people, I just cried to God. Now, God, you know, you know, I'm sick and tired of this, and they're, they're doing all this stuff, and I need to go to university. So in two years, I'm going through constantly, and so forth, and I finally got it. And he finally gave me. When I got there, you know, I had to leave my job. When I got there, what happened was that, and I told them that, and they said, well, what we're going to do, we're going to make you an employee instead of just a student so we can pay you more money. <laughs> God answers prayers. People, I tell you here, I stand before you that God answers prayers. God answers prayers. Now, he doesn't necessarily answer them when you want them answered, but you have to, you know continue to pray for it. And if it's not something that's going to lead you into sin, he'll entertain it. And in my case, he actually did that. 
And as a result of that, I have been able to go all kinds of places, do all kinds of stuff with that, simply because my wife used to tell me, wait, wait, we don't have any money to do that. God has control of all the money. So, you know, if you want a banker, right, go to God. He, he has control of all the money. You don't have to go to people. Go to God. He will fix it so you will get what he You'll get what God wants you to have. Right? So I, I'm just here telling now. He asked me. He asked me to talk. Maybe he's not happy with it. So anyway, now, one of the most fulfilling Christian experiences that I had was that, you know, is that I went to Tegucigapa, right, in Honduras, capital of Honduras. Now, previous to that, I had been, I was in the Air Force. I was an air traffic controller, and I was stationed in Spain, so that's how I learned Spanish. Then later on, you know, I went down to Puerto Rico, and I studied there for a while. Then I went to the university in Madrid. And so, little did I know that once I became a Christian, I was going to use that. See, you never know when you're picking up all these things, right? Because I always wanted to speak another language. When I was in the university, I studied, I studied, well, in high school, I studied Latin. University, I studied German. And also, later on, after I had studied Spanish, or while I was studying Spanish, they, they had university courses <coughs> in, in Spanish on the base. And so I also took Spanish. And so that was years, right, 20-some years, 30-some years, right, had passed by. And then I was at this congregation, and what they would do, there were people in the congregation that would help a lot of the poor countries and use that as a way of bringing people to Christ. And they had medical missions, and a lot of people who in those poor countries who could not afford health care and so forth and so forth. That they had gotten together various organizations, not the church itself. There were members of the church that set up organizations to do that. And so I was the only one, you know, from Memphis to go at that particular time because the brother and sister that normally go, I think both of them were nurses. They decided not to go to Honduras. They, they, they went to Belize. And so then they needed somebody to go, somebody who knew Spanish. And so the word got out that I could speak Spanish. Okay. So, okay. So I, what I did was I got some books on that had to do with, we'll say, medical Spanish. And I, I, I taught other Spanish, you know, while I was doing this, reviewing my own Spanish. And so my job was to serve as a, a translator from Spanish to English and English to Spanish. So I had to do simultaneous translations. And so we went there and what happened is I had, you know, I was sitting there and I was saying, oh man, it was the last day. I was saying, okay, God, yeah, well, you got me here and I really don't feel as though I did anything. It was the last group of people. It was the last day, I think on the 12th. And well, by the way, I did I, I provided translation services for 50 patients. Anyway, the last day, all right, the last people, and what happened was, I didn't know this, but there were 25 people. There was a husband and wife, we, we'll say, uh, that had gotten together, and they had gotten 25 people, and they wanted, they were trying to read the Bible, but they couldn't understand it. Now. What happened also, they had a particular preaching school that some brothers also, it didn't belong to the church, I'm just keep making this clear. There were brothers, you know, who actually paid for that, okay? And not too far from the hospital, the clinic that they had, they had the preaching school. I think they were still in the same town. And so they were going and we were talking back and forth and I was, doing the translation with this lady. She did most of the speaking. And so she said, oh, I just thank you so much. I don't know what would happen. 
you know, because we have this problem, that problem, health problems, and so forth. I said, don't thank me. Thank God. We're just servants of the Almighty God in Spanish. Okay. And then she said, then is when she began to tell me all about what they were trying to do. Right? And then what I did, I, I went and told one of the other brothers who were there to go and find somebody from preaching school to come to be able to teach them because I was getting ready to leave. And that's what they did. And there were 25 people. The last people, the last day. So they taught me something about God. When God tells you to do something, do it. Right? You don't, you, you know what I'm saying? You don't know when the blessing is going to come. So that taught me a real big lesson. So you won't hear me say, well, you know, da, 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 mm, mm, because you don't know when the blessing, it was the last day, and, you know, that's the most people that I have ever helped to come to Christ in my life. You know, and I was just so happy telling everybody that, you know. And so all I can say is that, you know, God is real. God answers prayers, okay. And we should never forget that. If you want something, go to the one who, who owns everything. God owns the planet. He owns you. He, own, he owns all the politicians and all these other folks. Go to God, right? He'll take care of it. All these people are doing all this stuff. Remember in Galatians what it says, Be not deceived, for God is not mocked whatsoever. A man, you know, souls that shall he also reap. He may not reap it here, but he's going to reap it later on unless he's repentant. But he may reap it here. So remember that. And don't, you know, and don't fail. Oh, God. Uh, oh I asked God two, two minutes ago and he didn't do anything. Right? That's not the way that you have to have. And, you know, and that's my wife a lot of times th you know, thinks that I don't care about stuff. It's not that I don't care. I have gone to God to ask God, and I'm not going to complain about it. And that's it. Whatever his will is, let it be, because I was an air traffic control. I probably, can, I, can I finish this up or not? Okay. I was an air traffic controller, right? And so what air traffic controllers do, they're the ones who tell the planes, when, you know, at what altitude they're supposed to be, Right, and whether they can, you know, and, and, and when they can come down into certain corridors to be able to land. Right? Why? Because on that radar screen, you can see every single plane, like little dots, you know, the heights of every single one, right? But the guy who is in his plane, all he can see is himself. He can't see anybody who's above him. He can't left or right, they're too far away, maybe a mile. A mile above him, a mile below him, and a mile on each side. He can't. And he thinks he's there by himself, but he's not. That's why you need air traffic controllers. God sees everybody and everything that's going on. He is the one that's under control. He is our air traffic controller. All we can do is see our little lives and how we're walking around doing stuff, but he sees everything. He sees everything. Okay? And he is the one who will decide, okay, you know, Brother Abraham is going to do so-and-so, right? Why? Because of the fact that I know, for example, this other person over here, he's looking for somebody, but I want Brother Abraham to be over there when he gets there. He is our air traffic controller, and with that, I just want to say that God is good. And I, I know this has not been a typical type of, we'll say, sermon, but, you know, those of us, those Christians who want to make a confession, or those who are outside of Christ, those who are outside of Christ, you have no idea what danger you're in. You have no idea how bad it's going to, what it already is, and it can be for you. You have no idea how good it's, it, it can be, right? Just the love of the brother and the sister, right? And the help that you can get. People who care about you. That, those are valuable things. You have so many people walking around, nobody cares about them. But here's not true, right? We are told that we're supposed to love each other. This is a commandment. 
So that's a that in itself is a one. If that were the only thing that you could get out of Christianity, that's worth it. And we know we're going to get much more than that. So those of you who are outside of Christ and you want to come to Christ, you can do so as we sing the song of invitation. Let's uh, let's change that last hymn to number three thirty three.